This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Harry Dent. Harry is a repeat guest from several years ago. Harry is an American financial newsletter writer and author. He takes a certain demographic approach to his analysis. As you might guess, especially today in 2022, a certain bearish overtone. We cover a wide range of topics today. Harry has a lot of views about where things might go. Now, you know, as a trend-following trader, I really don't know where they're going to go. But I do share with Harry some of that concern for the political economic moves being made these days. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation today with Harry Dent. I hope you enjoy Let's go big picture first. No solutions, no predictions. I'll share with you my thought in a second. You give me the point in time that started where we are today, because it didn't start this year or last year, the year before. It goes back some time. Where do you place the point in time where the chaos of 2022 starts and by who? It started in early 2008. And by the way, Michael, that's something I predicted in my early books in the late 1980s and early 90s, that the baby boom would have this enormous boom that nobody saw coming back then because there's so many of them. They're going to move predictably and they're peak spending at age 46. It's that exact on average. Then the economy would weaken from 2008 through 2022-23. In other words, we would have a long-term slowdown like we had in the 70s when the Bob Hope generation stopped spending and like in the 1930s when the Henry Ford generation in the roaring 20s bubble, and that was the last time we had a bubble economy, burst is not only the generational peak, but we did get a bubble boom and everything, real estate, commodities, stocks, even gold bubbled. And now this bubble, in addition to just a slowdown that would bring any stock market down to reality, we're bursting bubbles, global bubbles. This is the biggest event. And it started when the stock market peaked in October 2007 and the economy first moved into a recession in January 2008. That was the starting point. And ever since, the central banks and the Fed keep saying, oh, this is a short-term crisis, blah, blah, blah. If we just print a little money, we'll get over this. Well, 13 years later, they printed more money than ever until they had to reverse here because they overdid it with COVID. We've been living on printed money from 2009, the bottom of that recession. That's when they decided we're going to bring us out of this, started printing money. And they thought, oh, this will just take a year. And they printed a trillion. And you know what, Mike? I would have approved that trillion. When you're in a downturn, give a little boost to help us come out. But you shouldn't be printing money nonstop for 13 years without understanding something's wrong in the economy. What's wrong? A generation stops spending. And the millennials, although not as large relatively as the baby boom for the economy, it will take us out of this from, say, late 2024 forward. Another prediction I've had forever, 2024 to 37 will be the next boom in the United States, shorter, not as big as the baby boom boom. We're in a weak period. Actually, this is a good time to flush out the bad debts, take our hits in the markets and stuff, get things down to reality so the poor millennials can invest. No person now preparing for retirement in their 40s or 50s could even hope to make money with stock markets at these levels around the world. In fact, somebody predicted with these valuations alone, none of my predictions, downturn, nothing, you'd be lucky to make 2% a year. Nobody can retire on that. Let's take this back to your expertise. As I mentioned, I'm in Asia. Just anecdotally, I'll see stories often about demographics in Japan, demographics in China, demographics in India. It's often tough, as you know, it's tough sometimes, maybe more than sometimes, to connect the demographics exactly to 
when these booms and busts might happen. For example, I'm Gen X. So of course, baby boomers start to retire. They don't want to spend what well, there's like half of me at Gen X. So yeah, there's a reason. Speak to me about this idea of looking at demographics. If you want to use China, for example, if you want to use Japan, for example, just to bring people into the idea of why and an analysis of demographics can be useful information. First of all, I started out looking at five-year cohorts and saying, oh, yeah, we'll peak between 2005 and 2010 in the baby boom. Then I ended up finding a 46-year lag. I got more detail on spending and found out that the peak in the United States is age 46. So the simplest indicator, Michael, ever was my first one in 1988, the spending wave. Move forward the birth index, which I adjust immigrants into, which you can do with a computer, simple computer calculate forward for the peak in spending. And it says biggest boom in history, 1983, will peak by late 2007 and turn into a downturn. This is something that is precise because the spending, we never had data like this. Only in the early 80s did the U.S., and I don't have this in other countries, survey people every year and tell us exactly when people spend the most money and in 600 sectors down to potato chip. We have data we never had before. Demographics are more important than ever before for two reasons. The size of the baby boom, which exaggerated for the first time in history. Also, we became middle class after the assembly line in the early 1900s, i.e. thank you, Henry Ford, one of the greatest innovators in history, the Steve Jobs of his generation. The assembly line made us a huge middle class. We never had the everyday person didn't matter that much in history. Now they do. So that 46 year lag on the birth index tells you almost exactly when the stock market momentum and the economic momentum will peak and turn down. Again, I said back in my first book in 1988, the peak would be the end of 2007. That's very precise. Let me keep you at just two guys sharing. I'm curious, you just mentioned something not studying the international as much. I'm curious, I've seen reports that due to perhaps the one child policy in China, that they've got a demographics problem to where the 1.4 billion people, and I've seen various numbers argued, could literally drop by 700 million people in the next 25 years, that they don't have enough coming up. It's going to be this top heavy, like Japan, top heavy, older countries. Do you do any look at those particular countries? Everything I do, I do internationally. The demo, we have these age distributions. Sometimes they are only in five-year cohorts there, but yes. I'll tell you what you mentioned earlier, Asia, that's the next frontier, obviously. You couldn't be more different than Japan and China and India. Japan was the first developed country to peak in 1996. Their bubble peaked in 89, they had a burst, and then their demographics turned down after 96. Japan has had zero growth. Stock market has been sideways for 30 years. People just think, oh, bad management or bad monitor. No, they've been printing money forever. They were the first developed country to peak. And then Europe followed in the US and blah, blah, blah. And keeping Australia will be one of the last. The emerging world, China is the first emerging country and the largest and one of the wealthiest at this time to peak. China's one child policy does give it less favorable demographics. And by the way, China already peaked in 2010 to 11. Their demographics for decades to come in spending already peaked. The reason it doesn't mean an ultimate peak quite yet for China, they've only gone from 20 to 60% urban in the last few decades, and they're still going to go to 80%. Urbanizing triples the income. People in urban areas make triple what people in rural do in emerging countries like China and India. China still has some growth from urbanization, but guess what? They already built 22% empty apartments and office buildings, which is enough to house all those other 20%. China really is seeing a long-term peak here, but won't really falter more for a little bit down the road. India's just getting on it. India's spending wave doesn't peak till 2065. So Japan peaked in 96, China 2010-11, and India all the way out 2065. And they're in the same part of the world. I talk to a lot of people on this podcast. I tell people sometimes I'll talk to guests I feel like sometimes I have to carry the conversation. I don't have to carry the conversation with Harry <laughs> Dent. Okay, so <laughs> why do you have so much energy? Tell me something about you. 
I always had that. What I did, my parents almost disowned me. I got out of Harvard Business School, got a dream job with Bain and Company. I mean, frankly, just doesn't get better than that. I got an offer to a friend to take over a small publishing company in California that's in trouble. Something to me just said, go for it. I got to be a CEO of a $20 million company at age 27. Even Harvard Business School doesn't let you do that. I took that and that's where I learned the most. Yeah, Harvard Business School was great. Working with new ventures, I was seeing this is what causes growth. I'm seeing the people who start new technologies, new trends, not the Fortune 500 that are just maturing and making them a little cheaper, a little better and gaining market share. I really saw this is the key. And for those clients, I started studying. What are the cycles in innovation? Demograph, all this research I did in conjunction with being a CEO of several companies and consulting to many more in the innovative realm. That's when I got my aha. Oh, I'm supposed to go in Bain and Company, consulting to Fortune 500 companies, and then maybe move into Fortune 500 company. No, I got lucky and was thrust into the new venture realm where the real action, and as Steve Jobs says, the way to see the future is to create it. That's who I'm dealing with, the people creating it. That's what turned me from a business manager, analyst, consultant, how do you run your business better and grow and identify market, to being a futurist. I saw then, oh my gosh, these baby boomers were their customers. I'm consulting the Bain and Company to the Fortune 500. Their consumers were aging Bob Hopers, okay? Eating their Wheaties and stuff. I'm seeing the new baby boomers. I'm saying, oh my God, this is a giant generation. And when they grow up, there's going to be a giant boom. That's what got me into my demographic-based research. Economists today still don't think demographics matters that much. That's how clueless they are. And you know why? They've never started or run a business. So how would they know otherwise? Let me keep you at this energy thing for a second. You're not 22. You're not 42. I'm looking at you. You sound more youthful than plenty of 40-somethings, 30-somethings, and 20-somethings that I've met that just appear lackadaisical and smoking weed all day and have no energy. See, I'm 69, by the way. Why do you have energy? What's your daily routine? What are you doing? I walk 40 minutes in the morning, only begrudgingly. I hate exercise. <laughs> I like exercise if I'm doing something, hiking or something, but I don't like to get on a treadmill and just run to run. I walk because I'm in a pretty neighborhood and a nice area and stuff. You either have energy or you don't. And I get into something, I get passionate about it. When I saw this first indicator, when I saw, oh my God, we know exactly when the average person spends the most money age 46, and I lagged that and saw a total correlation with the S&P 500 adjusted for inflation, holy crap, this is the holy grail. And I just stumbled on it. Somebody else might think, well, that's just an accident or, or just, oh, that's nice. I'm like, no. I have passion and I can turn this into something. It's a whole new realm of economic research that looks instead of government policies and all that stupid stuff, which is just messing on the icing of the cake, who creates the cake? I'm an expert on what the consumer does from cradle to grave. They don't just retire at 63 and enter the workforce at 20 and peak at 46. Their kids eat the most potato chips when they're 42. OK, they buy a retirement home at 63. They don't retire at 65. Everybody thinks that my research, though, they actually retire at 63. So age is important. I just happened to trip on that when I was doing research for my leading edge clients that Fortune 100 companies wouldn't have even cared about this research. OK, I was dealing with leading edge companies, dealing with a new generation just emerging. I had to research that new generation. And that's when I got holy crap, the biggest generation in history is going to hit global markets predictably by age in the coming decades. That's when I wrote my first published book, The Great Boom Ahead. The word prediction, it can be messy. And everybody wants to compare and they want to hold people's feet to the fire, all kinds of stuff. I can find a ton of critics that want to say, well, Harry didn't get this prediction right, or he didn't get that prediction right. What I find interesting about you is at least you're in the middle of the conversation exchanging open dialogue about important issues, Fed policy, demographics, 
Whereas I think so many of the people that otherwise might be critics, they're just mouthpieces for the big systems, so to speak, either a secret mouthpiece for the Fed or a secret mouthpiece for corporate America. And they just repeat these announcements every day, every year on all the cable news shows. But on the flip side, you and I know if we look over the last handful of decades, we can see the 87 crash. We can see the summer of 1998. We can see the dot-com crash. We can see the Great Recession, the big short book. We can see 2020. We can see 2022. I appreciate anybody that's in this world trying to educate and spread some information versus so many of the critics are just mouthpieces for I don't know who they are exactly. And they just like to criticize people or make points on CNBC or whatever. Now, here's the important thing, and this is my biggest challenge. I do two things. I started as long-term forecasting. And I'll tell you right now, there is nobody better in the world than this. I have identified not just demographic, but technology, geopolitical cycles. I can tell your grandkids what the economy is going to look like anywhere in the developed world, even emerging when they're at the peak of their spending or when they retire today. Nobody beats me on long-term forecasting. So that's one thing. The other thing is short-term forecasting. I have a newsletter. I'm always asked, okay, nice to say we're going to peak somewhere around 2007, 20 years before it happens. Another thing, when it comes to there, when's the actual peak? And does this policy affect it or not? I do short-term technical analysis. Now, that's the difference, and that's where people get confused looking at me. I do both. In my newsletter, I have to call the short-term and the long-term. The difference to my newsletter subscribers, I say, when I'm saying something short-term, and if I'm really good, I'm right 60 to 70% of the time. I am going to be wrong. Long-term, when I said momentum with the baby boomers going to peak back in 1988 and 2007, I wasn't even off a half a year. That's long-term, simple, fundamental, projectable. When is a big group of people going to spend the most money? That is projectable. Understanding that every decade, we tend to get a pretty major correction. 80% of the time in the first two to three years, that repeats a lot. There's things you can predict. There's things you can't. But the more you get short-term, the more probabilistic it becomes. And that's where I get in trouble. People say, oh, you claim to be able to predict stuff. Yeah, but short term, only people in my newsletter understand, I tell them, short term, I am making an educated guess whether the market's going to bottom here at 2200 or a month or two from now at 1900 That's always educated guessing, and that's better than being clueless. The short term and long term forecasting are two entirely different disciplines, and I'm the best in the long term. Nobody has predicted things I have as far as advanced so accurately ever. Are you considered baby boomer? Yes, 1953. Baby boom for me, the real rising tide, the wave that affects is 1937 to 61. I was in the latter middle of that, 1953. Just two guys talking. It sure seems like, given to the bubbles on top of bubbles, now some people might be saying, well, Mike, you don't know that these are bubbles on top of bubbles. In the last 10 years, a lot of QE a lot of zero interest rate stuff. How do you feel for friends, associates, that perhaps they don't look at the markets like you, they're not thinking about the markets, they just kind of trusted the system. They just trusted the system, they went along with it. They don't really know why the Dow turned around after COVID and went to all-time highs. They don't know, they're just sitting there, 75, 80 years old, they're feeling, man, I feel great, I'm going rock and roll. And then this year hits. You and I both know that this is all about contingencies and if-thens. And there's an easily imagined future where U.S. equities go sideways for a decade, right at the point in time where the vast majority of boomers are retiring. Exactly. And that's something I've been warning for a long time. The baby boom that created this great boom, as they start to retire, they're going to suffer the Gen X downturn. <laughs> Is which is going to hurt the returns on their portfolio. It's not going to hurt their jobs as much because they're going to be retired by then, but it is going to hurt the returns on their portfolio, which is what they retire on it. And that is a problem. I mean, in other words, 
every generation, I'll lay it out right now, 1930 to 42, sideways the down economy for 13 years. 1968, peak of the Bob Hope generation spending cycle. Into 82, the bottom, 14 years sideways to down. And now 2008 through about 2023, sideways to down. The only difference this time, since the central banks have fought this downturn so hard and pumped it up, we're going to have to go down one more time when this stimulus fails, and they've been forced to tighten, by the way, by their own extremes. This is probably not going to bottom until 2024. Naturally, I predicted way back that we would have a sideways, long-term downturn, much like 1930 to 42 from 2008 to the end of 2022 for the stock market and end of 2023 for the economy on a lag. Now you're going to have to put that out about a year or so because the central banks have messed with the economy so much. There's been a lot of news in the last week over in the UK, some of the fixes their government had to roll out, and who knows exactly what those fixes were behind the scenes. Essentially, it was a pension problem. There's a pension problem in America, too. A lot of these are government pensions, which is really interesting because there's really not private pensions anymore. So you have a very large segment of America, unbeknownst to them, bailing out government sector pension funds, which the private folks don't even have. Speak to this idea, though, of facing a lost decade, potentially, and pension funds not having the returns. As you say, people, they're using their the retiring and the money they have, that's what they're retiring on. We really could be in a situation where boomers now, they could be in real trouble is the point that I'm getting to. This is a predictable crisis. A big boom happens because of a large generation, then they retire, and then they're depending on government, Social Security, and pensions and stuff that have been invested for them. Then their slowdown and their retirement kills the economy, which kills the returns on all these funds. That is the case here. There's no question that as we move forward here, we're going to have to restructure a lot of things. A lot of benefits are going to have to maybe be renegotiated. So I'm like, look, everybody had good intentions here, but nobody expected, by the way, my forecast from the top in January 4th in 2020 for the S&P is going to be down 86% by, say, mid-2024. NASDAQ down 92%. In the 70s, we got a lot of 30, 40, 50% corrections. This is like 29 to 32. I call it a great reset. And crashes this big only follow big bubbles. So this is going to be a shock to the whole system of pensions, retirement for baby boomers, everything. Nobody expects their stocks to go sideways for over a decade when they've done nothing but go up most of their lives. But it happens every 40 years. You're looking from the top of the NASDAQ to the bottom of the NASDAQ. You can imagine a 92% drop. Let me tell you how simple that is. It's just a return to the last major lows in early 2009. It's not going back to 82 or 75. It's just a return to the last stock bottom. We have bubbled so much because of the overreaction of the Fed and all this stuff. They had printed so much money, $10 trillion, half a GDP almost, in the last couple of years that they have just created this monster. And now it's got to crash and go down that far. We're only losing a little more in the last decade of gains in a major 90-year and 40-year generation cycle. Now, by the way, you talked about bubbles earlier. Bubbles are even rarer. The last bubble economy was the Roaring Twenties, the 1929 bubble peak, 90 years before this. There's a 90-year, what I call, super bubble cycle. It's two 45-year technology cycles. Every other one gets more bubbly, has this thing, oh, they're going to change the world, the internet. Back, it was electricity and cars and phones and stuff in the Roaring Twenties. You get bubbles. Bubbles are even rarer. The whole 40s, 50s, 60s boom was not bubbles. The first bubble had mini bubble, 87. Ooh, big bubble, tech bubble number one, 2000. Well, tech bubble number two just peaked in November 22nd, 2021. Bubble bursts are more damaging and more extreme than normal generational bursts. That's why a 92% NASDAQ is very similar to the 89% Dow crash at 29 to 32. That's the only thing you can compare this to. Now, people tell, Harry, that's too extreme. No, I'm comparing apples to apples. You call me extreme because you don't understand where we are 
on an extreme bubble and burr cycle, which has happened in the 1800s and the early 1900s. This has happened before, twice since the Industrial Revolution. You have to look here to understand. And if you understand this, I don't look stupid anymore. I don't think you look stupid. Crazy. People think I'm crazy. It's not my expertise to make this. Even Jeremy Grantham is predicting a 50% down there. 92%, okay? That's crazy. It's not my expertise to be able to make a prediction of the NASDAQ going down minus 92%. However, let me add a few data points. Remember, that's a short-term prediction in the 60 to 70% probability range, not 100%. Let me take it back to the fall of 02. I believe in the fall of 02, intraday, the NASDAQ was down over 80%. The peak to trough, the NASDAQ went down 77% on the close in the fall of 02. If we also look at, you brought it up, March of 09, that was the bottom for the three US equity markets. If something didn't happen there in March of 09, the Fed changing of accounting rules, et cetera, it wasn't like US stocks were going to not keep going down. They were absolutely headed down. And there was emergency hanky-panky behind the scenes. I think on first blush, people might hear minus 92%, 60 or 70% confidence level there. It's not hard to imagine, given everything that we've seen since the dot-com bubble, which has been literally 22 years of madness. <laughs> this is a bigger bubble and more global. You would expect a second bubble, similar, but even bigger and more extreme and more global, to have a bigger crash, 92% compared to 78, doesn't sound crazy. You're exactly right. People have to have that perspective. They don't. Most people don't remember the NASDAQ went down 78%. Here's the most important point. It did that when a boom was still in force. The demographics were still positive then. So of course, you're going to come out of it a little earlier and stronger than you're going to come out of this one when the demographics are dead. The only way we came out of the NASDAQ drop was because they dropped rates to basically zero and created the real estate bubble. It was all kind of connected. Exactly. They just switched the bubble from tech stocks to real estate. Exactly. And that's worse. Real estate bubbles are much more damaging to many more people. It's amazing how much things have changed in just 14 or 15 years because nobody thought U.S. real estate could go down. Today, you would think that that's such a distant memory. We're right back to what we were saying in 08, real estate can't go down. It really didn't much. Even in the Great Depression, real estate only went down 26% because back then lending was so restrictive that you really couldn't have a bubble like you could now. So you're right. We had bubble. The real estate bubble came out of the tech bubble crack. First real estate bubble peaked early 2006, a crash. Nobody thought exactly. People tell me the one thing that will never go down is real estate. And that's why people switched to real estate after tech stacks crapped on them. Well, now we're in the second real estate bubble this time. And again, why this is such an important point, the real estate bubble, the stock bubble, and just before them, the commodity bubble, every and globally, it's all peaking together. Stock bubble peaked in 2007, 2000, real estate 2006, stocks again in 2007. But this time, everything and globally is peaking together. Here's my indicator, the simplest way to view this for people. If you thought 2008 to nine suck, multiply that times 1.5. It's going to last 50% longer. It's going to be 50% deeper. Stocks, real estate. Instead of real estate down 34, it's down 50. Instead of stocks down 57%, the S&P is going to be down 86 for the S&P 500. And instead of lasting a year and a half, it's going to last two and a half years. That's my view simply. 2008 to nine should have been 30 to 32. Governments blew us out of that. So we didn't get to get out all the bad debts and, and zombie companies. Now we're going to have to do it on the backside instead. This downturn is going to take us lower. And that's my forecast. And I'll tell you, from what I'm looking at, it's pretty damn clear. It's not a wild forecast, given how big a bubble this bubble was more extreme. And it's an everything bubble for the first time ever. There's something that we've really not talked about in this conversation, which you could say is extra gasoline on the fire to potentially back your perspective. The Fed was not facing this issue. 
in 02 when they brought rates down. They were not facing this issue in 08 or 09. But now we've got radical inflation. By the way, totally artificial. My research also early on, I got that one year after the spinning wave, the inflation indicator. It's just workforce growth on a two and a half year life. It's incorporating new young workers at great expense to parents and governments initially, and then totally to the economy and businesses when they hire them and train them. That's what causes inflation. The 70s inflation was a natural inflation. It wasn't government deficits causing that. That was nothing. This is 100% artificial. Well, this is the Fed. Zero to 1% now, and it's at over nine. That was totally from printing $10 trillion fiscal and monetary stimulus in two years. <laughs> this is totally artificial, totally created by governments. The only good news is because they went so far overreacting to COVID, which was a natural disaster in the first place. So why overreact? Not like somebody did something wrong in the economy. But because of that, they're forced to tighten. And they're saying, oh, the economy's so strong, it can handle this tightening. No, the economy is only strong because all that stimulus. And you not only withdraw it, but turn it to tightening. This economy is going to get weak very fast in the next year. And I don't think they're going to be able to turn around fast enough to stop this slide. But that's the million dollar question now. They will try to go higher than ever. Will people lose confidence in the Fed after the last stimulus bigger in history failed so quickly? Or will the Fed even be able to react quick enough now that they're on a tightening thing? And it doesn't look good to reverse a decision like that too quick. That's really saying the economy's weak when you tighten because it's too strong and you suddenly turn around, oops, we were wrong. It's really weak. I don't think they're going to react in time. Just a side tangent here. We've been talking about the boomer generation. I can think back to my grandparents. I guess that's the greatest generation, so to speak. Now there's finally some interest income. But for the longest time, to have all these folks facing retirement and to have interest income removed from the system, they, they can no longer get any consistent cash. Without buying junk bonds. <laughs> right. Telling these older folks that you've just got to stay jacked into equities at 70, 80, 90 years old and hope you can make your, quote, income through growth gains and equity markets. So many aspects of society have just got turned upside down in the last 20 years. Yeah, and again, have to make it on equity gains when models that have nothing to do with growth in the economy, just on valuation, say the best you could hope for in the next 12 years is a 2% a year average gain in stocks when people need 7, 8, 9, 10% and been getting more than that for decades. You're right. People are not going to see this shock coming in portfolio returns like in this conversation started. It's going to affect the entire retirement system, pensions, people's personal savings for retirement. And baby boomers are going to realize, oh, my gosh, I can't afford to retire. Then on the other hand, oh, my gosh, the economy's crashing. I may get fired or I may not be able to get my job back. All I can do, I can't change this. People following me, this is no surprise. I've been forecasting this would happen for decades, not just recent years. If you see it coming and you get out when the gains are overvalued, people have had more gains than they deserve in the stock market and real estate for a long time. You get out near the top and all you have to do, because the good thing about crashes is they happen a lot faster than even bubble booms, okay? A bubble boom may take five years to really bubble up. The crash takes two and a half. A short period of time, Everything comes down to reality. You protect yourself and get more defensive. And then you get to buy long-term assets, real estate, stocks and stuff, gold and commodities again, at bargain prices that'll give you strong returns again. This is the best gift an investor could have. The problem is 98% of people aren't going to see it coming. If they just heard me in a casual interview, they'd say, that guy's crazy. There's no way the NASDAQ can go down 92%. The Fed won't let it happen. Well, the Fed caused this damn bubble. What do you mean? They're the cause of this thing, and the bubble is the cause of the crash, and they're not going to be able to stop their own bubble they've taken it so far. Here's the thing, too, to keep adding extra data points from around the world onto the top of this conversation. The yen down almost 30% this year. You've got China real estate and all kinds of aspects of China society in a mess the overdoing it on COVID. In Europe, clearly, the entire continent is having to refigure out how they do energy a few months before winter. On top of that, you've got war chants going on. 
it's really an amazing period of time to where not only all the issues that you and I've been talking about, many of them American centric, you look around the world and in some ways, independent type events, it's a cautionary time to me. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's a cautionary time for people to at least raise their antenna and pay attention. That's why these fundamental cycles are important. When the economy is growing, you have a growing pie. Well, everything's easier to take. Oh, war's easy to finance, or people don't even want to fight war. They're too busy making money. When the economy starts going down, warfare will go up. Budget deficits will go up. All types of things will happen. The whole system goes into shock. It's not just stocks go down and people lose some money on stocks, or the economy slows and businesses have to lay off some workers. It's easier when things go up and everything gets more difficult. People are going to fight and react more vigorously when things are going down just because people are uncomfortable. There have been wars in history started just to pull a country out of a recession or a depression. What do you say to some of the young people? We haven't really brought them up though, but the young people in the last decade have gone down their own path. Perhaps they were influenced by the Great Recession, didn't trust the system. Bless them, I can understand that 100%. But they went down a path with first Bitcoin, then crypto, and then Dogecoin and all kinds of stuff. Clearly, some early adopters have done exceptionally well. I salute being in early on the speculative bull, but a lot of people have gotten killed. A lot of people have been taken to the cleaners. What's your perspective on crypto? Crypto is the future. It's the digitization of all financial assets and money globally. It's the base for a whole new global monetary system. And here's the bad news about that. That's going to take decades to happen. This is just like the dot-com stocks. Remember the dot-com in the first tech bubble? Amazon went public in 97 and $6 to 136 and then the crash went all the way back down to 6 It's a shakeout. Basically, that's where we are at. We're in a second tech bubble that's getting ready to crash. Again, crypto is that new leading edge thing in what I call its baby bubble, like the dot-coms and Amazon had from 97 to 2000 and then crashed. Crypto, my only forecast worse than a 92% NASDAQ down, is Bitcoin down 95 to 96% to about 3,200. It's already been down to 17 it's the lead bubble, just like the dot-coms were back there and the internet stocks were the lead bubble back then. It's the lead bubble, so it'll have the biggest crash. I don't know what's going to happen to 9,000 to 40,000 overnight companies that basically went tradable with no cost because of <laughs> that's one of the innovations of crypto. You go public with no cost. <laughs> Most of those companies are just going to go splat, but some are going to survive. Bitcoin will probably end up becoming the standard for a global monetary system where everything is convertible into Bitcoin and not the US dollar anymore. Why have things convertible into one country that might have been dominant in the past, may not be in the future, and politically may be positive, negative, da 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 da? Bitcoin becomes the neutral arbitrator. That's the future of crypto digitization of financial assets, Bitcoin becoming the standard for a global monetary system so that it can be more transparent and governments are held accountable for monkeying with their currency. Now, they already do that. We print money, our dollar is going to go down. Whoever's printing the most, this will be even more direct. I think crypto is the wave of the future, but it's in its baby bubble and it's going to have the biggest burst of all. I'm not going to even look at Bitcoin till it's in the three to 4,000 range, and then I will probably buy some. You give the very optimistic perspective on Bitcoin. I think a lot of people would probably take very different perspectives. Like it's an invisible coin. <laughs> I think the thing for me is there's no movement. There's no movement in the current existence that we're seeing right now for Bitcoin to reach what you just described. How far ahead are you looking? And look, it might not be Bitcoin. Maybe it's something else. But how far ahead are you looking to the potential where you can imagine some independent blockchain technology becomes a store of value that people trust more than national currencies? How far ahead are you looking? A decade or two. My forecast 
is that Bitcoin will go down to about three to 4,000 and eventually go up to half a million to a million, 780,000 is my most precise guess by about 2037 to 40. It'll come up in our next boom. It'll be just like the internet came in the dot-com crash and the early 2000s recession, all that stuff, and then came out into the boom following that, okay? Well, this comes out into the next boom. It's in its innovation stage. It's going to be a huge shakeout. Like I say, 40,000 coins, forget it. They ain't going to have 40,000 coins. That was just the way people went public cheap. Those companies will still exist, but nobody's going to care about their coins ever. They're just going to disappear. Let me keep you with this for a second, because this is really interesting. It's controversial. Explain to me how you can imagine countries like America, China, the euro losing their power. Because if America doesn't have the power to maneuver with the dollar, for example, like we've seen in the last handful of years, if they don't have that power to maneuver with the dollar, what kind of country is America? First of all, that's not how I would see it happening. Everything's convertible into the dollar. The dollar is the global standard for money. Everything's convertible and measured against the dollar. And that's crazy because the dollar is variable and stuff. Now, so is Bitcoin right now. But if Bitcoin was mainstream and worth half a million, a million dollars a coin, and everybody had it accepted by then, 90% adoption, the difference in Bitcoin is it's neutral. It's the only thing to be global. The U.S. is not neutral. Russia's not neutral. U.K. is not neutral. China's not neutral. It could be that global standard. And that's what I could see. And for Bitcoin to be what gold used to be the standard before we kicked it off in 71, Bitcoin in that half a million, a million thing becomes increasingly worth more than all the gold in the world. So Bitcoin can grow with the global economy better, can be worth more than gold. It's a better standard, but not now. Global Bitcoin is more volatile than anything, and it's still small. That's why Bitcoin would have to boom for a long time and get up to that level of value before it could be seen as a global accepted asset that could be used instead of gold as a new standard for a digital global system. Countries still can print their own money. It's just measured against Bitcoin. There's to be a U.S. dollar. You can still print money if you want to, ill advised, but you can still do it. Does Bitcoin forecast that you make, if that's to come true, doesn't that take power away from something like the Fed? It does. And that's a good thing. What's the problem today is governments have raced to see who can print the most money, creating the biggest bubble in history. And when everybody's fine with it now, wait till it crashes. People are going to be P-I-S-S-E-D. This is what allows a new standard. Right now, would anybody vote for Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin becomes more acceptable, predictably, on an S-curve, an adoption curve like anything else, and people see the whole international monetary system break down like the early 1930s, you can't imagine what I'm saying happen until you put that scenario through, and then people are really pissed. And people are realizing nothing works, so we need something new. And you know who has confidence in Bitcoin and crypto? The young people who are going to drive the next boom when baby boomers are dead. That's how it happens. New generation and things that don't look possible now become possible. I hear you the way you're responding. I guess my point ultimately was, is that the central banks will fight Oh, absolutely. They don't want this. No, that's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting People at. People will have to start saying, if you guys keep printing money and doing stupid stuff, we're just going to put our faith in Bitcoin, favor the systems or the countries that do that. It's the young people are going to revolt and say, hey, we never really liked this system in the first place. Now that it's crashed and burned, more like the early 30s, which people said would never happen again. One of the major Fed chairmen, I can't remember, said, our goal is to not have a recession anymore. No more recessions. I'm like, you idiots. The recessions are the best thing that happens to economies. After a good boom, there's always waste and inefficiencies and overinvestments and malinvestments. And a recession clears it up like common coal does really quickly. You get sick and get over it, and boom, you're healthy again. Recessions are necessary. Otherwise, God's an idiot. These central bankers are playing God. And I'm saying, by overplaying God for decades now, creating the biggest and most global bubbles in history, they fueled it more than anybody. 
they're the ones going to look like idiots and they're the ones going to lose credibility and get their asses kicked when this thing falls apart. And people are saying, well, we're not doing that again. We're not listening to these people again. They're going to come up and say, well, now we need to print $30 trillion, one and a half times GDP to get out of the next mess. And people are going to say, sorry, you did that already a couple of times and it didn't work. And that's been the trend. Economy gets in a downturn. They print a bunch of money. It has a boom. Then it goes to a bigger downturn. They print more money. Then they have another boom and then a bigger downturn. This is a losing game because guess what, folks? You don't get something for nothing. You cannot cure a deep economic downturn by printing money out of thin air. My disgust, not that people should understand, but that people believe that printing money is a solution. That's so obvious. It's like a magic act. You give the optimistic perspective of a new form of independent currency developing in lieu of assorted country central banks continuing down their same path, which has not been a pretty path. However, paint a scenario for me the other direction. What could happen in your mind if the alternative independent currency doesn't develop. And we are left with major countries in this. They don't call it printing these days. It's modern monetary theory. Yeah, modern monetary theory. It's basically just something for nothing policies. It's the biggest pile of garbage in economic history. This is going to go down is the biggest, most idealistic economic proposition in history. They call it now the great experiment. It is an experiment. And this one's going to fail because you don't cure economic problems by printing money. You have to restructure your economy. You have to restructure your tax system. You have to do all these sort of things to deal with a downturn. First of all, thinking downturns are a mistake by God and something to be fought is stupid in the first place. Recessions, you cannot have a boom without a recession because without a recession, you don't clear the decks in efficiency for the next boom. Politicians and economists see recessions as the enemy. No, the way to minimize a recession is not to go crazy in a boom. What comes out of the greatest downturn in our lifetimes, only comparable to the early 30s, people are going to be looking for something went really bad wrong. And they're going to look back, what changed in the 90s? Money printing off wild. So we can't let governments just print money without abandon every time we have a problem. We need a new monetary system and something that does not encourage that. By the time we come to those conclusions, years and years from now, Bitcoin will come out of this crash, start to gain momentum again. Then it'll be easier to entertain. Well, why don't we use Bitcoin as it gets more accepted as a new independent, neutral global standard for money. It's not money. You're not paying in Bitcoin unless you want to. It's the standard upon which all prices and all currencies are compared at all times. That's what I see Bitcoin as. I think an important point to make, even if someone listening and they're saying, but Mike, you didn't push Harry hard on his predictions. He's not backing up everything in this conversation. Okay. That's not the point. Or somebody might say, Mike, You didn't push Harry. I mean, he's talking about Bitcoin going to the moon. All fair, whatever. Who listening right now can disagree with what you just said about the money printing, about trying to eliminate recessions? This is the part where I find that sometimes we all get so focused on personalities or someone said this one thing, throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what you just said about the money printing and recessions is so damn important. And I think if the average folks could really wrap their arms around how the system has been manipulated for the last handful of decades, we'd be better off. I appreciate the fact that you zoom right in on that. There's all kinds of potential solutions, but the first thing is to describe what the hell the problem is. It takes something often really fail. I mean, I also tell people, where did you learn the most in your life? From your successes or your failures? Nobody answers that wrong. Everybody says failure. There's nobody said, oh, yeah, my successes. No, successes make you complacent and inflate your ego. Failures make you reconsider everything. What did we miss? This is going to be the biggest economic failure since the early 30s. And that throughout history, since the Industrial Revolution has happened every 90 years, this should be expected if you look at history. 
We're going to learn huge lessons in here, and it's going to make us smarter, and we're going to come out of this with a better system, but only after the one that has already created the greatest bubbles in history. And bubbles always burst. There's no other scenario of a bubble than to burst. And no, there never, ever been a soft landing to a bubble. Never. And there won't be this time because they created one even bigger. Even their counter things are not going to be enough when this thing blows. We're going to learn some big lessons, and we need a new system. The world only became global since World War II, increasingly, and really since the 80s and 90s. We need a new global monetary system. Every time I'm traveling, I'm getting ready to go to Europe and to Australia in the next month. Every time I'm traveling, and I have to convert my money, it's all crazy and stuff, and it's changed. There's something wrong with this system. The one time I go to Australia and it's worth 45 cents, and the next time it's worth 67, the same country, the same goods I'm buying, this system is flawed. It's a whole different conversation, but we know one reason why the so-called leaders like this monetary system, because they can hand out so-called money to people that aren't doing anything. Frankly, it's a very political type of thing. It has nothing to do with running an economy these days. It's very political. Harry, we could go on forever. If people can't find you, I think there's something wrong with them if they can't find you. But where can we direct people to, Harry? Where would you like to send them to? Best single thing to do, harrydent.com. That's our web address where you come and you get on our free newsletter. I have a paid newsletter monthly with updates and all this great stuff, but we have a free weekly newsletter. You get an article every week from me and my great partner, Rodney Johnson. And that's a way to get to know us. Right now, if somebody thinks what I have to say has merit, I just get on my newsletter because this is the time when it's happening. Anybody can get on our free newsletter and every week get two articles and get to know us. HarryDent.com. And then our broader website is HSDent.com. How many of these conversations can you do in a day? Because I tell you, you've expended some energy in the last hour. <laughs> well, and I tell you, people don't understand an hour and a half is my typical speech. Man, I'm ready to die after 90 yeah. minutes. I'm alive when I'm on stage, but it does take a lot of energy. You're right. I wouldn't want to do 10 of these in one day. Three or four <laughs> can do. Two is optimal. I'm glad I got you early. I'm probably your first of the day. Listen, Harry, good stuff. I'm glad we caught up again after I said at the top uh, eight years. Fun stuff. I appreciate you coming on. Enjoyed it, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.